I must say that I am moved so much from what I heard today, from what I saw today, and from I, what I'm starting to understand for the first time in my life, what is the meaning of this conference. <laughs> my task is very simple. I have to present the next speaker. Here sits a man. Since I know him, he is going side by side with us all along the time. And when we are shouting about the situation, he is there. Pastor Hagi taught me a sentence which always I can hear in my eyes, Israel, you are not alone. And when he says it, he means it. When he said, Israel, you are not alone, he means it full-heartedly. When it is a war, he is the first one to be in Israel. In the concentration camps, Pastor Hagi and Diana went to the concentration camp, to the March of Living, and put the yellow tag to identify with me and with you because they are proud friends and lovers of the state of Israel. Israel, you are not alone. This is a powerful, powerful sense. I can speak about him long, and you don't have the time to give me. Only one thing, Pastor Hagi will love you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, honored members. Tomorrow, Don and I are going to leave for Israel for our 38th trip. We're going to take 400 people with us and a television crew <laughs> and a television crew that will live with us for about 10 days. We will be with television telling the story of Israel to the nations of the world. I am delighted and highly honored to be invited to address this distinguished assembly of Jewish and Christian leaders. I was asked the question, what's the difference between the Christians today and the Christians who carried out the Crusades? That's a good question. I have a very blunt answer. The Crusaders were not Christians. They were murderers, thieves, rapists, demanding that Jews convert or be killed under the command of the Roman Catholic Church. They were, in the, they were the Middle Ages version of ISIS, period. Don't ever call them Christians. They were not Christians. Christians are people who obey the teachings of a rabbi by the name of Jesus. Think about that. Who summarized the essence of all of his Torah teachings in one statement when he was asked by an attorney in his audience, give us the summation of what it is you're trying to teach the world. He said it is in these two statements. Love your neighbor as yourself and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What a wonderful world we could have if we could just manage to obey those two simple principles of human behavior. There are two ways to live, the Torah way and the wrong way. Any person who claims to be a Christian and does not love other people is not a Christian. Wearing a cross around your neck does not make you a Christian. Carrying one on your shield does not make you a Christian. It is not possible for a person to say, I am a Christian and not love the Jewish people. They have given to us the word of God. They have given to us Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have given to us the prophets. They have given to us the first family of Christianity. All that we are, we owe to the Jewish people. Think about it. Judaism does not need Christianity to explain its existence, whereas Christianity cannot explain its existence without Judaism. This is a statement I've been making for 40 years, and people still don't get it. 
There is no such thing as Christian anti-Semitism. Christianity represents the love of God. Anti-Semitism is driven by hatred. Love and hate do not come out of the same soul. Bitter water and sweet water do not come from the same well. Anti-Semitism as sin, and as sin, it damns the soul. That means in Christian theology, you go to hell if you're an anti-Semite. I know a number of you have been telling them how to get there for a while, <laughs> but God's going to arrange it someday. <laughs> so I'm asked the question, what about the Presbyterians who are leading the BDS effort? Please be informed that the Presbyterian Church USA is rapidly losing its membership and some of the most distinguished pastors are now pro-Israel and have joined Christians United for Israel. I want you to listen to this letter. I want you to listen to this letter that I received the other day from Reverend Dr. Kenneth Lartner pastor of the Deerfield Presbyterian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. This letter is written to the Presbyterian Church USA leadership. It says, Dear Sirs and Madams, quote, I was appalled to receive an email from yourselves expressing your full solidarity with the movement for black lives and typing your support to an implacable opposition to Israel and to Egypt. There was not one reference to the murderous actions and undying enmity of Hamas and Hezbollah to the Jewish people and their determination of Hamas and Hezbollah to annihilate Israel. I continue to quote, Apparently the elimination of the entire nation of Israel is not as serious as the suffering of the Palestinians whose leaders have consistently refused to negotiate for peace or even recognize the existence of the Jewish state. I continue the quote. As a minister of the Presbyterian Church USA, I not only reject your call to solidarity, but curse your bigoted, anti-Semitic, discriminatory rhetoric and actions against Israel. The words of Jesus are as wept as he wept over Jerusalem seem relevant to this denomination. Quote, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Sincerely, Reverend Dr. Kenneth C. Lartner, Deerfield Presbyterian Church, Louisville, Kentucky. I continue. If you want to hear a suicide message, that was it. He used to be in that church. He won't be long. Since the Presbyterian Church USA has sided with the enemies of Israel, their membership is falling like a rock. Their membership has fallen from 3.1 million people to 1.5 million people, and over the past four years, they are losing 5% of their membership per year. On the other hand, as Tevye would say in Fiddler on the Roof, while the Presbyterian Church USA membership is now about 1.5 million and falling like a rock, Christians United for Israel's membership is 3.2 million and it's climbing every day. <laughs> the message is those who are for you are twice the number of the people who are against you and we are in the trenches fighting anti-Semitism every day in the church world, in the university world, in the political world, because we are not fickle friends. We are with you through thick and thin to see that Israel is defended in the United States of America. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, quote, to see evil and not call it evil is evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless, end of quote. What the PC USA, the Presbyterian Church USA, is doing to e Israel is evil. It is contrary to the word of God. It is economic anti-Semitism, and God will not find that 
guiltless. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. It's good for a church denomination as well as it is an individual, individual human being. Secondly, the battlefield report for CUFI on the campuses of America concerning BDS, state by state. We consider this economic anti-Semitism. Statewide victories. In August 2016, Christians United for Israel on campus students in Ohio introduced and passed a piece of legislation to the Ohio College Republican Federation stated that they will reject and condemn the international BDS movement against the state of Israel. They are currently in the process of presenting this to the Ohio General Assembly and the Ohio governor to pass and sign this bill into legislation in the state of Ohio. The second report, the spring of 2016, Christians United for Israel on campus introduced and passed legislation to the Arizona Federation of College Republicans that state they will help fight BDS on any campus in Arizona where it arises and will support the state of Israel as an organization. The students at University of South Florida were able to prevent a BDS legislation vote on their campus. It's the second time these students have stopped this bill from being passed. Other victories. CUFI on campus has either stopped or delayed BDS at Portland State University, at Montclair State University, at the University of South Car of Florida in Tampa, the University of Texas at San Antonio, was able to get the students of justice in Palestine, justice in Palestine, end of quote, suspended from campus for a school year for their hateful actions toward the Jewish students on the campus campus of UTSA in San Antonio. <laughs> Simply stated, CUFI is at war with anti-Semitism. We are presenting a stone wall of resistance to BDS, and our Washington, D.C. office is bringing heat on politicians who waffle on their support of Israel. The politician from Georgia who recently called the Jewish people termites is presently back backpedaling full force. He is apologetic in every way. For Zion's sake, we will not be silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, we will not be quiet. What's the solution for this? What's the answer for turning BDS on its head? For helping the millennials to snap out of their pro-Palestinian deception and defeating anti-Semitism in America and Europe, where we now have a thriving CUFI organization in London, and I assure you, London has to be one of the most anti-Semitic cities on the face of the earth, period. Here's the answer, is to develop a cadre of trained leaders, whether it's a father, a rabbi, a pastor, a political person, who, has, who is armed with truth and light, who can and will attack the darkness of anti-Semitism and the unjust persecution of the Jewish people. That when you see anti-Semitism, you will speak up and resist it. You will organize to stop it. You will not look the other way. You will encounter it on every occasion and press it until it disappears. That's what we're looking for. What is a leader? If you can't define it, you won't know what it is when you're looking at it. He who thinks he's the leader but has no followers is only taking a walk. <laughs> Christianity is not, I mean, CUFI is not taking a walk. After 10 years, we have 3.2 million people, and they are aggressively supporting Israel any and every day they receive the rapid response from the ministry. What is a leader? Having your name at the top of an organizational chart, a chart does not give you power. The position does not make the person. It's the person that makes the position. Margaret Thatcher said, being a leader, being a leader is much like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, 
you aren't. <laughs> what is a leader? By definition, Harry Truman said, a leader is someone whom other people gladly follow to accomplish a given mission. That's what we're looking for. That's what we should be developing. In the home, it's the father. In the synagogue, it's the rabbi. In the church, it's the pastor. In the nation, it's our political leaders. A leader is not someone trying to be all things to all people. I'm reminded of the story of the 40-year-old bachelor who was searching for the perfect wife. Someone who was a mixture between Elizabeth Taylor and Betty Crocker. <laughs> Good luck with that. One day on a business trip, he got on a plane. He sat down, and the most beautiful woman he had ever seen walked on the plane and sat down beside him. He was breathless. His heart started. In sheer desperation, he blurted out to her, What kind of a man does a beautiful woman like you really like? She looked at him and said, Well, I like in and then I like rednecks. They have a... You can't be all things to all people. To escape the prison of public opinion, stop allowing the foolish opinion. You can't be all things to all people. To escape the prison of public opinion, Stop allowing the foolish opinions of other people to control your life or anyone else's. Take charge of your life. I was called a heretic in bold headlines of Christian publications. When I met with them and explained what I was doing, they joined us. But they had a knee-jerk reaction, which was an anti-Semitic reaction. When Rabbi Scheinberg and I who's with us tonight, to which we owe a great deal of support, for there would never have been a night to honor Israel without him. When we had the press, first press conference saying we were going to have a night to honor Israel, they shot out the windows to, uh, to my car that was parked in the driveway in front of my house. The night we had the event, they threatened to blow up the building at, at the end of the service, thank heaven. But it only convinced us that we were doing the right thing. Persistence overcomes resistance. And if you're not persistent, don't even think about getting out on the dance floor against anti-Semitism. This is not something that's going to go away. It's something that we're going to have to run it off the block and keep it off the block with perpetual diligence against it. A leader is not a dictator who refuses to listen to the opinions of other people. When you get grandchildren, you will find out you're not the smartest person in the room all the time. <laughs> the other day, my five-year-old granddaughter came into my bedroom with her computer in her hand and said, Papa, do we have Wi-Fi in this house? I looked at her and said, we're good to have television. Sit down. It's easy to dictate, but in dictation, creativity is destroyed. People can have a different point of view from you and not be wrong. As Christians and Jews, we should remember we can have different points of views on some very major issues and still have a great relationship. If you've been married 30 days, you know that's a fact. Go ahead and breathe. <laughs> a leader is not an egotist with eye problems. I think, I will, I am, I did, I said. Relying on other people means you're no longer the center of, att of attention. Your ego is not stroked since the attention is spread out over several people. Egotists do not make good leaders, and God knows Washington is saturated with egotistical people who have quit serving the American people and have started serving their own purposes. 
God's standard of greatness is expressed this way. He that is the greatest among you is the servant of all. A leader is not resistance to change. People who want progress without change are not leaders. They are roadblocks to success. Leaders com comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Maintaining the status quo is full retreat from progress. God is never going to give you your instructions to go beyond your last act of obedience. Leaders make decisions that create the future they desire. Losers make decisions that create the present they're willing to tolerate. And you're in one of those two groups. Leaders master the crisis. They never allow the crisis to master them. I give you the illustration of General of Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander of the U.S. Navy in World War II. He was notified by Franklin Delano Roosevelt that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Nimitz flew immediately to Pearl Harbor to examine the damage. After looking at America's greatest naval crisis in history, he was asked by his command staff, what do you think, Admiral? And his response was, God was with us. And looking at all those ships turned upside down in Pearl Harbor, it sounded like a lunatic statement. Nimitz said the Japanese first mistake was to attack us on Sunday. Ninety percent of our people were on shore. If they had been in those ships, our death rate would have been much higher. The second mistake is they didn't bomb the docks. Because the docks were not bombed, the Navy was capable of repairing its ships right then. Otherwise, they would have had to tow them over to California to have them repaired, and it would have been months before we could have gotten back in the war. And the third mistake, he said, our fuel depot is five miles in that direction. One plane with one machine gun could have destroyed that fuel depot, and for months we couldn't have flown a plane or floated a ship. God was with us. Nimitz mastered the crisis. He had carriers repaired in one week. He had the U.S. Navy in full fighting capacity in six months. They met the Japanese at a place called Midway and crushed their superior naval fleet. It turned the tide of the war, producing a victory for the United States of America. May God give us more leaders in this country like Chester Nimitz in our government, in our military, in our pulpits, in our synagogues, in every way of leadership, let us as citizens of the United States, as Christians and Jews, decide that we are going to stop anti-Semitism. We will stop BDS. We are going to drive the enemies of Zion off the map. We can do it. We will do it. In closing, let me state one of my favorite statements of Winston Churchill in the dark days of World War II, when London was being bombed by the Nazi Air Force. He said, you ask what is our aim, I can tell you in a word, it's victory. For without victory, there is no survival. End of quote. As Christians and Jews, let us tonight agree to unite our forces until we have victory over every enemy of Israel. Let us be determined. Thank you, sir. Let us be determined that with God's help and unified together, there is no enemy we are afraid to combat. There is no enemy we cannot take down. We have 3.2 million people who are ready to respond on the rapid response, instantly, there is a home force in defense of Israel because God's unique way of bringing Christians united for Israel into being. May God bless you, may God bless Israel, and may God help America put someone in the White House who will stand with Israel. <laughs>